All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is the Q&A session for chapter 12 on educational testing and assessment. And we have today um, Michael Walker uh, here. Um, we are very, very happy to have you uh, with us today. And yeah, I, I hope we can have a very nice conversation and discussion. Yeah, I hope so. So I was just uh, um, telling Sergei, um, Sergio, that there are many different ways we can go. I have a short presentation on uh, fairness in general. I'll give you an idea of, of where I think the standards need to go. I have answers to your questions. We could go through the, uh, what is it, 18 different standards in chapter 12, one by one, and blow them up and then put them back together again. So I'm very um, easy. What's your preference? I mean, we could, uh, so I have lots of options and I'm very flexible. Okay, so I, I think maybe it makes sense to, to start in that order, to have first the presentation that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and then to have uh, the responses to the questions, and then um, maybe then we can have a little uh, room, for, we can have uh, some room for, for follow-ups, and, and yeah, follow-ups and questions at the moment, and then we can maybe go through the standards and leave that at, at to the end, if we have time, because sometimes the discussion and follow-up of the question can take a lot of time. So we can see. Cool, so uh, let me start here then. Um, it's always nice to know who you're talking to. So let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm Mike Walker. And um, so I was born a long, long time ago in, in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. So um, I was a product of the South and uh, with all of its uh, trials and, and tribulations. My mother was a, a student when I was born. So she had promised her dad that she would get a degree in, in education. She, she would be the first person in her family to go to college. And, and she promised her dad before she died, before he died, that she would do that. So unfortunately, uh, when she decided to go back to school, she was pregnant with her fourth child, which was me. So uh, that was my foray into higher education. My dad had a high school degree, and uh, he worked nights as a janitor so that he could take care of us during the day so mom could go to school. And uh, so later, mom started teaching at an inner city school, uh, Catholic, but very poor, predominantly black school. And uh, we had hand-me-down books, and our gym was a uh, concrete tarmac outside where we practiced basketball even in the winter. So um, very poor. But I got an opportunity when I was uh, seventh grade to go to an independent school. They had offered my brother a scholarship year before, and then they offered it to me. So I got to go and experience independent school for two whole years, you know, and what a great opportunity. I never knew that there was so much to learn, you know. So I remember the summer before I went there in sixth grade, I was outside playing and I was thinking to myself, you know, um, why is it? And I had seen this in my classrooms. Why is it that some people struggle so hard to learn and other people really just, they gravitate toward it, you know? And even with the, the meager materials that we had, some people just really seemed to thrive while others really suffered. They just struggle so hard. And I decided at that time that I was going to um, make this my life's work to study education and to study why uh, children, uh, some had hard time learning and others did not. So um, I studied clinical psychology for many years. I thought I'd go and uh, study early childhood autism because talk about an educational, cha pardon me, educational challenge. It's a big one. And um, but somewhere along the way, I realized that um, clinical psychology really didn't interest me. Mostly I, I talked to clinicians and I was bored to death by what they were telling me they did every day. And, but statistics fascinated me. So at the last minute, I changed to um, uh, my field to quantitative psychology. And I, when I say last minute, I mean last minute. I applied to uh, University of Illinois the day before the applications were due. As I called them up, like, because no fax machines, uh, forget email, didn't have that, you know. So so I had to FedEx all my materials. I called them up, said, look, here's the deal. And I explained it to them. They're like, okay, FedEx to us today. Well, FedEx material tomorrow, right? And then FedEx to us as soon as you get it back, which is what I did. So um, uh, costly, but um, they reimbursed me. And, and I got in, it's amazing. So I got my uh, degree in quantitative psychology and statistics. I taught at the Ohio State University. Oh, you might notice that the is now trademarked by Ohio State. And 
Um, so no using that word unless it's followed by Ohio State University. And I taught there for six years. And But then uh, I, one of our graduates worked at ETS and he's like, Mike, you love it here. And now truth, truth be told, I really wanted to go into testing because I wanted to stay close to my mission. I thought that would be a good opportunity for me to help um, to refine the tools that we use to understand where children were in terms of their educational progress. And, but, you know, my advisor's like, it would be such a waste if you did not go into academia. So I went into academia, hated it. So, but, but I love teaching. I just didn't like that whole research service t uh, teaching trade-off that didn't appeal to me, but testing did. So when I found out about ETS from my uh, former student, uh, I applied reluctantly and they agreed to interview me reluctantly. And on Valentine's Day, we had the interview. It was love at first sight. And I knew they were going to offer me a job. They knew I was going to take it. And I had never looked back. So I did, however, after working in psychometrics for many years, uh, go to college board to work in research. They came back here when they opened the Center for Equity, which is focused exactly on what I told myself so many years ago that I wanted to do, which is to figure out why some students got lots and lots of opportunities and other students got very few. And so here we are, and, and I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm happy to talk to you today about some of the things we've been working on. And if it's okay with you, oh, let me pause for questions because I can answer any questions about me if you have any, or I can continue with my presentation. Oh, this is great. Yeah, I, thank you for, for, um, uh, for sharing this. And, and yeah, uh, to put, put in context the, the why you were so important and the right person for this chapter. Um, yeah, when I was thinking like, who could, who could be the person uh, to respond to the question for this chapter, uh, yeah, I had a feeling that you were the right person. And I think this is, this is good. Well, cool. Let me show you this presentation. I think it'll take about 20 minutes. Um, uh, this is a very shortened version of a very long talk that I gave before. So um, let me see if I can share my screen. I think it is this one. Let's find out, shall we? Do you see a presentation, equity and assessment? Yes. Awesome. This is great. Okay, so um, and this is just a quick overview. So now the public has many different viewpoints about fairness. Let me say that. And if you ask them what we mean about by fair test, they may give you one of these viewpoints. Equal process, which focuses on uh, making sure that everyone gets the same test under the same conditions. And this is really a viewpoint of standardization that the standards are wrapped around. Someone else may say that standardization is not fair to certain groups, such as people with disabilities and English learners. We need to get them certain accommodations to make sure that they have the same opportunity as others to show what they know and can do. And this is also encapsulated in the standards that we're studying. And still others may argue that if there are subgroup differences, then the process must not be fair. So let me pause and ask you, what do you say makes an assessment fair? Is it inputs? Is it content? Is it process? Is it outcome? So why not do this? Just take a few minutes, drop your thoughts in the chat. And while you're doing that, let's look at some other sources and how they view fairness. I should open my chat so I can actually see what you're saying. Well, I can't find it. I think so I have to uh, very so. very vivid discussions about this when we review the fairness chapter actually. Oh, okay, uh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll have to read them later because I can't see my chat right now. I've got like like full de um desktop. So let's talk about the standards. They list fairness as a fundamental validity issue, and first, fair treatment during the testing process, and then. Um, uh, so this view focuses mostly on standardization again, with all test takers having the same basic testing conditions, as well as similar prior exposure to the testing process, especially where technology is involved. And, and one of the questions had to do with the pandemic. This was a big issue because not everybody had access to technology to even participate in the lesson, let alone take tests um, during uh, the lockdown. So, so you also have to acknowledge that sometimes we need to be flexible to provide essentially equivalent opportunities for some test takers for whom certain aspects of the testing condition present an undue challenge. 
And the standards also talk about fairness as a lack of measurement bias, right? And the test scores have to mean the same thing for everyone. And so we look for differential prediction and other signs of differential test function. And the problem is that our current methods really treat very heterogeneous groups as if they are all the same. For example, think about how different the people are that we classify as Asian. They're Chinese, Filipino, Hmong, Indian, Japanese, Korean, Laotian, Malaysian, Thai, Vietnamese. Why would we expect that all these very different cultures would approach a test in the same way? But that's where we are, right? So it's kind of like um, trying to, like the way we test for differences is kind of like trying to cut a birthday cake with a chainsaw. So, so accessibility, uh, contrast the knowledge, skills, and abilities measured by a test with other knowledge, skills, and abilities needed to respond to the test, right? So if a person understands the tested material, but they can't answer the questions for another reason, that's a problem. And we wind up wrongly concluding that the person doesn't understand the construct, and that's not fair. So we have to make sure that everyone has equal access to the material. And that's why we have fairness guidelines for test developers, and why we have accessibility tools for test takers like bi bilingual glossaries and screen magnifiers, alt text, and so on. So here's the question. Are we sure we've covered everything? Are there some things missing that we have not even thought of? I think that's where the testing community is today. And, and that's where a lot of people are. If you went to NCME, you probably heard a lot of talks that were focused on that issue of fairness and how to make things even more fair. So how we interpret test scores is also a fairness issue. And this is related to measurement bias. We want to treat people as if they are all the same for convenience, but I'm sorry, they're not. And people from different social and cultural backgrounds may respond differently to test questions, even if their capabilities on the measured constructs are the same. And so the relationship of language proficiency and context is a good example. So here's what I mean. Consider two home environments. They're linked to lower oral English skills. So on the left-hand side, it represents a lower SES African-American family. And the figure on the right represents an immigrant family in which Spanish is the primary language spoken in the home. So in both cases, we can expect that children from these environments, when these families um, will have less developed so-called standard oral English skills when they start school. And in both cases, this is because the children tend to be exposed to less frequent standard oral English with smaller vocabularies, less complex syntactic structures than higher SES children from English speaking households. So, and because early oral language skills predict later literacy, which is an integral part of academic achievement, we can expect that children from both these environments will achieve below grade level when they start school. Now, if we believe that children from these environments have similar learning trajectories, then we're going to look at this situation as a deficit. Or we could consider that children from both these groups just have different skills. For example, one study found that um, African-American boys were accomplished storytellers who integrated poetic devices, sound effects, and movement. And another noted that the games African-Americans learn as children often involve um, poetic improvisation and spontaneous wit. In other words, African-American children may be highly advanced linguistically, just not in standard English. And for their part, bilingual children show superior performance on tasks related to executive function and attentional control. They also tend to have more advanced metalinguistic skills than monolingual children. So if we're assessing these two groups of children on some subject matter other than English, but we test them in standard English, they probably won't do as well as if we found a way to give them access to the material via some more familiar medium. So some threats to valid interpretation of test scores include test content that may be unfamiliar or possibly unsetting, upsetting to certain groups of examinees, test contexts that may interfere with retrieval of knowledge. For example, testing a highly introverted person in a crowded room. So, or items that elicit unintended responses from certain groups. And a classic example was an old, old, old IQ question that asked, what color are rubies? And African-American children often responded black like me because Ruby was a very popular female name. And, and finally, we have to think about opportunity to learn, which um, uh, we'll discuss later. So 
let me say this. So critical el element 4.2 of the peer review guidelines lays out the government's criteria for ensuring that, quote, the state has taken reasonable and appropriate steps to ensure that its assessments are accessible to all students and fair across student groups in the design, development, and analysis of its assessment, end quote. So, and this includes uh, use of universal design principles in develop, development and language simplification, which might address the example we just looked at, use of accessibility tools that we also talked about. And we have to think about bias and sensitivity training for item writers, field testing of items to see how well they work. Now let's drill down a little bit on this whole notion of universal design for assessment. So now the National Center on Educational Outcomes drafted the Universal Design for Assessments based on a review of the literature on universal design, assessment, and instructional design. And the UDA includes seven elements that the authors say can help make tests more accessible to all students, including students with disabilities, English learners, English learners with disabilities. And the authors claim that application of the universal design principles can also increase assessment validity presumably by reducing the amount of construct irrelevant areas. And so you can see the elements here. They are inclusive assessment population, precisely defined constructs, accessible non-biased items, amenable to accom accommodations, simple, clear, and intuitive instructions and procedures, maximum readability and comprehensibility, and maximum legibility. And I have to note that the concept laid out here are pretty vague, but I could see how with a little more definition, these elements could improve an assessment. But here's the thing. I think that the universal design for assessment principles was meant to address the traditional situation in which we have a single standardized assessment applied to everyone, like the GRE, for example. And we present, represent multiple subgroups in the test items. We perform our fairness review and diff we allow accommodations, and maybe we include names and even situations that are multicultural. But I think there's a limit to how much we can tweak the test in one direction without having an equally undesirable impact on another group. So no matter how I read this framework, essentially I see it improving a standard assessment built from a unitary perspective. And what I mean is there appears to be little room for differing backgrounds and sociocultural contexts that could influence assessment performance. And our measurement models and interpretations, even if the condition of universal design as specified here are met, do not provide mechanisms for accounting for context effects. And at some point, we just need to acknowledge that not everyone views a test the same way and not everyone's capabilities are reflected in the same way by the test. And the general problem with this approach is as Author Jason Reynolds said, whenever something has been standardized, that means that we have made someone invisible. Now let's look at one last perspective. Rasuli and colleagues in reviewing the literature on classroom assessment uncovered several themes related to test fairness, and I've listed them here. So opportunity for learnings involves access to quality resources and test content, varied learning opportunities based on differential learning abilities, styles, and exceptionalities. Access to demonstrate learning means providing students with multiple, varied, equitable, and meaningful opportunities to demonstrate their learning. And it includes transparency, justification, and effective communication of grading criteria and consistency in their application. So accommodations we talked about, the authors here drill down on accommodations and modifications for English learners to make the test congruent with language ability and cultural background while pursuing the same objectives of the original test and without simplifying the cognitive or critical thinking load. Do no harm means that students, like we treat students with respect and care and protect them and their families from harmful personal impact of these assessments. Constructive classroom environment uh, tells us to pay attention to power dynamics and respectful relationships. Avoid score pollution uh, means we should avoid factors that are construct irrelevant to achievement, such as effort, progress, compassion for students, impact of grades on future opportunities. And this category also includes construct 
underrepresentation. And uh, finally, group work and peer assessment includes issues related to group composition, equity and grading, involvement in criterion development, gender bias, friendship bias, and cognitive bias. So the authors also talk about fairness issues in non-assessment domains, and these include sex bias, distributive justice, procedural justice, interactional justice, pedagogy, students' fairness-related beliefs, group work and peer assessment, and instructional accommodation. So um, this is a good paper to read. It's uh, uh, very interesting. And finally, let's talk about understanding standardized assessment. Now, we haven't really gone over the guidelines for fair test items, but let's look at a possible math problem anyway. What do you think is wrong with this problem? And if, if anything, just drop your thoughts in the chat. And while you're writing, I'll, I'll read Jamal and Dwayne are standing together on one corner of a football field. Jamal takes three steps along one edge of the field. Dwayne takes four same size steps along the other edge of the field. Dwayne walks straight to where Jamal is now. How many steps would he have to take? So what's wrong with this? I gotta see if I can peek in the chat and see what you're saying. I see a couple. Okay, students might not relate to the football scenario, which could cause them to interact with uh, item differential differently than intended. And another said football means different things in different cultures. Although it might not make a difference that the, the, the basic shape of the field is the same. But people go, field, don't you mean pitch? Yeah, so and there are lots of other things we can think about. So according to most fearless guidelines, I mean, this would be unacceptable. It requires knowledge of a football field. It's about sports. Is the location even relevant to the problem? Lots of words. Does this involve stereotypes? So there are all these things going on in your mind. And uh, so let me give you another version. Two people stand next to each other. They started walking in straight lines that are perpendicular to each other. One person walks three yards, the other person walks four yards. How far apart are they? Now, if you ask the test developer, they'll go, this is very um, um, acceptable because um, the unnecessary information has been deleted. There's less text. The conditional syntax, if Dwayne, blah, 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 has been replaced by brief statements of fact. Okay, so acceptable, right? But here's the thing. The second problem is sterile and is context-free. The first problem paints a picture that many test takers can relate to. And the real question is, would the context make the problem easier? So according to the standards, the first one is completely unacceptable, but intuition might tell us that it might be a better problem for certain test takers. I mean, that's where we are. So you uh, uh, like get rid of everything that has anything to do with context in the hopes that you can make the test universally accessible. But in the process, you may take away the exact contest that makes it more accessible. So and the question is, who sets the assessment framework anyway? In a recent issue of EMIP, uh, Jennifer Randall, who's at UMass with uh, Theorio, is she challenges this notion that removing these so-called culturally laden context effects um, makes the test more fair. And she argues that doing so means that by default, the test will reflect the dominant culture. Doing so makes the test less accessible to people from other cultures, and therefore it may not be as valid a measure for people from those other color cultures. And remember what I said earlier, not everyone views the test the same way, and not everyone's capabilities are reflected in the same way by the test. Here's an amusing story that kind of illustrates the point. So Greenfield described a situation in which researchers applied a classic measure in a different culture. So um, and, um, I'm quoting, Cole, Glay, Cole, Cole Gay Glick and Sharp took an object sorting task to Liberia where they presented it to their Capelle participants. There were 20 objects that divided evenly into the linguistic categories of foods, implements, food containers, and clothing. 
Instead of doing the taxonomic sort expected by the researchers, participants persistently made functional pairings. For example, rather than sorting objects into group of tools and foods, participants would put a potato and a knife together because you take the knife and cut the potato. According to Glick, participants often justified their pairings by saying that a wise man could only do such and such. In total exasperation, the researchers finally said, how would a fool do it? The result was a set of nice linguistically ordered categories, four of them with five items each. In short, the researchers' criterion for intelligent behavior was the participants' criterion for foolish. The participants' criterion for wise behavior was the researchers' criterion for stupid. So the point is it makes a difference, right? And this is the challenge that was facing the Hawaii State Department of Education with respect to students in their Hawaiian language immersion programs. These programs are not just teaching a standard curriculum in Hawaiian. Rather, the entire curriculum is designed around Hawaiian culture and customs. Students were taking the standard accountability exam and they were failing miserably. Was it because they could not access the information because of their Hawaiian immersion? Or was it that their curriculum approached the material in a fundamentally different way than the curriculum on which the accountability exam was based? Hawaiian students were learning measurement, for example, based on traditional and personal method of measurement, but they were being tested on the metric system, which is totally foreign to their way of thinking. So the Hawaii DOE had a decision to make. Do they continue to test the students using the standard assessment and try to teach to it? Or do they create an entirely different assessment that reflected their culture and customs? And they opted for the second choice. Developing the test really was a community venture. So you had community members actively involved in the process because they were the holders of communal knowledge. Parents, teachers, administrators, testing experts, they all took part. And their purpose was to produce an assessment standard that aligns with Hawaiian perspectives and beliefs. How do Hawaiian students tap into the abilities of their ingenious predecessors? So the team builds cultural validity through the development process. Teachers in their item writing and reviews can help to identify potential sources of cultural bias. Students do their cognitive interviews. They can help to understand students' approaches to solving items. And in the process, we can better understand where students are having difficulties. Now let's pause here. So now if you ask the people who develop Smarter Balanced Assessment, for example, they'll tell you they also work with individual stakeholders. But as I understand it, here's what happened. So a team of experts developed the test blueprints, which they then opened up for two rounds of public comment. And this is fundamentally different than building the test blueprints together. In the case of Ka'eo, the, the Hawaiian um, immersion exam, the result was an exam in Hawaiian that reflected knowledge, skills, and understandings that the students needed to become successful members of their society, including the skills that would prepare them for college. And evidently, it's working pretty well for them. And you can find more about the Kaipuni Assessment of Educational Outcomes in the 2019 NCME Conference on Classroom Assessment Materials. And there, there's a breakout section one, session one, Context Matters, Promise of Cultural and Community Validity and Assessment. And I put the link on the chat. I'll share this um, slide deck with uh, Sergio and you can uh, share it with others so that you can have access to all the material that I reference. So here's some more things to think about. Um, what is the context of the test? What's the intended outcome? Is it to segment the population, to hand out prizes to the highest scoring, to evaluate where students need to grow, to evaluate what students, what teachers need to help each student advance? How is the test presented to the student? Is it presented in a way that encourages all students to show what they know and can do? How much standardization is even necessary? Is it possible to allow students multiple pathways to showing what they know and can do? Is it possible or is it necessary even to produce comparable evaluations of students across assessment modalities? Are test scores even necessary or are there other mechanisms for providing feedback that do not require a label that automatically segments people into tiers. Maybe it reduces them to tiers. Are the test developers from primarily one culture? How diverse is the pool of test developers? Could the implicit biases of test developers result in test questions that are inaccessible to segments of the tested population? 
have the test developers receive cultural training and and i'll say cultural training not sensitivity training so that they are aware of socio-cultural differences and the way students learn and the way they express knowledge and just to elaborate to me cultural training um uh, like sensitivity training is like the short training session where people learn to do a sensitivity review. Basically, don't ask questions about cooking, don't ask questions about wars, and certainly don't ask questions, questions about cooking wars. So Bobby Flay is out of the question. So cultural training is longer and more intensive. It covers intercultural dynamics, issues of racism and classism, implicit biases, and ways to avoid their influence. It's long, it's painful, it's very worthwhile. So, and if we're not doing cultural training, um, how are we going to be aware of socio-cultural differences in the way students learn and the way they express knowledge? Are test developers aware enough to be able to critique themselves as they are performing their work? And this is very important to be able to stand back and go, wait, I'm doing that bias thing again, and with, with honesty and without guilt. Oh, so the goal is to build an authentic assessment that's fully accessible to test takers. But what does it mean to be authentic? Authentic requires, authenticity requires research to fully understand the social and cultural context in which the test is given. And the movie Black Panther gives a good object lesson in creating authenticity. So at the outset, director Ryan Coogler had to imagine what an African nation completely free from colonial influence would look like. And he imagined a world with no sexism or ageism, and this allowed him to put a young female in charge of the science and information exchange. There would be no European influence, so he researched a dozen traditional African nations to better understand their dress and culture. He made sure that um, all the actors wore their hair natural, and this attention to detail helped the film resonate with the audience and provide some positive role models, even though they're completely fictional. And compare this to other films that you might have seen about African nations that did not take this um, approach to authenticity. So here's some other things to think about. In what ways do different test formats lead to unfairness? Uh, multiple choice, multiple selection, student produced responses, teacher evaluations, they each have their upsides and their downsides. And I think it's important to reflect on those very carefully to make sure you're um, doing things that are going to maximally benefit the test taker. What can we do to make each test format more fair? How can different scoring methods lead to inequities? And this includes objective scoring, machine scanning, human scoring, AI scoring of student produced responses. All these things have, again, their advantages and disadvantages and their own implicit biases. What kind of evidence can we use to determine if test items unfair? What does an unfair test item even mean? So right now we need to change the way we envision standardized assessments so they better reflect what people from different social and cultural backgrounds no one can do. And our research team here at ETS has come up with some provisional principles that we believe will support socio-culturally responsive assessments. We believe that um, culturally responsive assessments require a process that shares power across all concerned parties. And this, this means including them in all relevant stages of the assessment process like the Ka'eo exam in Hawaii, for example. And this shared power includes monitoring the consequences and the, uh, of the assessments and their uses. Okay, and culturally responsive assessments will maximize flexibility to account for individual and cultural differences. Flexibility should consider the interests, preferences, needs of all the members of society while prioritizing those who have been historically excluded from assessments, education, and opportunity. And these tests will challenge students with rigorous content. And rigor entails an environment in which each student is expected to learn at high levels, receives the appropriate support to achieve those high levels of learning, and demonstrates such high levels of learning, right? They foster academic engagement and belonging in academic environments. So, so the student essentially taking this test can see themselves in the test and go, yes, I belong here. And culturally responsive assessments are designed to reflect assets-based perspective that measure what students know and can do, and they disrupt these traditional deficit narratives and systemic inequity. So here at ETS, we're in the beginning phases of a program of research um, that will test and tweak these principles to see what differences they make. And the ultimate goal is an assessment that is culturally responsive. So that's all I got. Um, questions? 
I guess I can stop sharing this now. Thank you very much for this presentation. This was really, really, really good. So please. Kind of, sure, it was longer than I thought, but <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I mean, no, it's fine. Uh, if anybody has some follow up, feedback, comments? No, well, while you're thinking. Why don't I ask, answer the questions that you already asked, and then we can, uh, if you have other questions, you can shout them out, drop them in the chat, whatever you prefer. So the sure. first question, That's what's sure. that? Give me, let me uh, uh, give one uh, comment mm -hmm. before going to that. I think during the discussion of the, of the standards, mm -hmm. we de de definitely all the, the topics that you have presented today have been in our in our discussion in some way. Uh, definitely after we studied the fairness chapter, we, we started to include much more of this. Uh, we had a Q&A session with Professor Jennifer Randall actually, in which she Perfect. also sp spoke a lot about the, the, her work. Unfortunately, that session wasn't um, shared to the public, but uh, definitely um, the idea that you have shared, I think have been going around. Mm -hmm. However, uh, relative to chapter 12 on, on the standards, uh, yeah, I think that chapter will, I mean, it's already summarizing a lot of what is particular for educational testing. And many of the discussions that actually cut everything in the standards will require to also be reflecting chapter 12 at some point. Um, and yeah, I, I think in general, in, in the group, uh, we have been uh, supportive with all these ideas. But also, also, also sometimes we are not that, we, we don't know that much. And, and unfortunately, some of, some of the topics and, and the idea that you have, we don't, uh, we, we don't, we don't know that much because there is no that, that many resources or places in which you can actually learn. So that actually has been interesting about the study, the study group that in, in parallel within, with the study of the standards, we have been learning also a lot about the, the topics that you have mentioned. Um, and it makes a lot of sense actually to, to, to bring those topics now for the chapter in educational uh, testing and assessment, because um, I guess that, that should be the future of of educational testing. So that should have much more presence in future version of the standard, I think, uh, uh, for the specific chapter on educational testing and assessment. Yeah. I'll mention somebody else at UMass. They just happen to all be at UMass, like I don't know why, but um, Darius Taylor, who um, uh, uh, developed the Wrong Answer Project, explored uh, people's feelings and thoughts and responses to standardized tests. And I think this process is very important. This interrogation of the test taker is a very important early step in deciding, deciding uh, how to build an assessment that will really serve the test taker and not um, implicitly or, or inadvertently punish them. So, and that's Mike's rule number two, by the way. If you don't know, you better ask somebody. So, and that's the first step, just ask. And they'll tell you what they need. They'll tell you how to ask them those questions so that they can give you an answer that reflects what they know and can do. Yeah. And, and that's what Hawaii did. That's unfortunately not what we generally do today. We write the items and then we give them, we field test them and go, well, we got your input. Uh, yeah, but it's late in the process. How do you know they would have even asked a question like that? You know. So there's another technique that's um, more in classroom assessment than in standardized tests, but I think we can adapt it. It's called the question formulation technique. And, and you can look this up. And basically, um, you before the lesson, it's more for classroom uh, discussions and even classroom assessments. Before the lesson, you just ask the kids, you know, to write down the things they want to know. And in the process of studying, they're answering their own questions that engages them. They get excited because they learn the answers. And I think they're going to do better on the material because they're really retaining it because they have a, a desire to know this 
and that's very important. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name, please. Uh, you have your hand up. Please pronounce your name for me. Mary. Yeah. I I am connected through the phone. Just uh -huh. so you know, it might be delayed. I am Merve Saraj, and it's really nice to have you, Dr. Walker. This was a really interesting talk. I am curious what you think about the fairness. Does it exist for, because we have been talking about heterogeneity and as much as being inclusive to those uh, heterogeneous aspects in our data sets and people's test-taking behavior. I'm thinking, are we talking uh, about the fairness for groups of people, or are we talking of of fairness for an individual? Uh, because I can see within an individual, one administration over another may not be fair to them, depending on if they were ready to take the test or not. Right. So I'm curious if it if fairness exists for groups of people or at the individual level, basically. What a great question. Can I just say that, Mary? It's a great question. And here's why. If you look at the Supreme Court, they do not guarantee group rights. There's no such thing as group rights. They're all individual rights. Yeah. And and if um, yeah, and even the example I gave earlier of the kinds of groups that we politically define like Asian Americans, they're so heterogeneous. And and what looks fair for one subgroup will not look fair for another. So I think you're right. We really have to drill down to the level of the individual. This is more difficult, but um, if we really want to serve each person, then we have to do that. So you throw out diff. I mean, like diff is so worthless these days because of the way we do it. I think there's a way to adapt it, but really you're going to have to push that envelope all the way, almost all the way down to the individual level to understand what works for each person. And the, the more we, the closer we get to individualized, personalized learning and personalized assessment, the closer we get to that ideal. And, and really, what's the point of a test? If it's not to benefit the individual, then why are we doing it? Now, so far, we use a test to like compartmentalize people to make the teacher's job or the supervisor's job easier, right? We just uh, give them a test and then we track them into little tracks and then, and then it just makes us feel like we're we're doing something to help them, but lots of times we're not. We're doing something that hurts them. So we really have to be mindful and cognizant of the consequences of everything that we do. Um, yeah, and that's um, another ETS or Sam Messick. I mean, this was his big point. We, validity has a lot to do with consequences. And, and, if, and if it's not uh, helpful, then why are we doing it? So I love that question. Thank you so much for asking. It. Thank you for answering. Yeah, it's been on my mind lately. I have another follow-up question mm -hmm. too. Uh, I've been thinking about how we treat examining these groups of test takers equally versus equitably. Right. And I wanted to hear what you think the difference between these two adverbs are basically in the testing world. Um, Another great question. I almost have to apologize because I'm about to talk about somebody else that goes like this at the University of Massachusetts. But Steve Cerisi wrote this great article called Understandardization, right? So, and his point is the standardization has to do with equality, right? So you standardize, everybody gets the same thing. It's great. Everybody feels good. And, but on the other hand, if we really want to serve everybody well, we have to get rid of that notion of standardization and really understand each person's need. And, and that will point us in direction of equity, which means that everybody gets what they need to do what they need to do. And um, unfortunately in the United States, it's a hard sell. Everybody wants equality, not equity, right? And, and, and yeah, that's unfortunate because it just doesn't work for everybody. And let me give you an example. Um, is that, is that fan behind me too noisy? Okay, you can still hear me okay, good. So I won't bother to turn it off. So um, recently, Joe Biden, bless his heart, said, you know, we have uh, this inequity in housing in the United States, which is true. There were all sorts of laws put in place to make sure that um, African-Americans could not buy houses, right? And, and, and it persists to this day. It's unwritten rule now, but it's still in place. And so Biden says, we're gonna get rid of that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna give every first time homeowner a $15,000 credit. 
it sounds great, you know, because like we're going to get rid of that inequity. No, you're not, because everybody's getting the same thing. And some people don't need that $15,000 credit. So what you do is you raise the floor a little bit, but the rank order stays in place. So, so um, that doesn't do anything to help get rid of the inequality and equity, which is um, um, fundamental to a lot of the problems in this country, because power, I mean, lies in um, wealth, not income, and wealth relates to property, right? So, so even if uh, the earnings look the same, if you don't have any amassed wealth, then you're still working at a disadvantage and you will continue to work at disadvantage for generations and generations. So equity, it sounds very socialist because it is. And what bothers me is that people in the United States don't want to admit that this really is a socialist nation. I mean, like just look at the way um, federal government um, um, distributes money among the states. There's certain states like New Jersey that pay more than they receive. And there are other states like Kentucky that receive a lot more than they pay, a lot more. And, and this is socialism. And I'm okay with that as long as it's going to help the individual in each state. I, of what I'm not okay with is the hypocrisy that goes, how dare you be socialist? And I'm not going to pick on any Kentucky centers, but how dare you have like socialist ideas? And I'm like, dude, you benefit from those socialist ideas, appreciate them from what they are. And, and, and I'm sure the people in your state do. So yeah, equity, that was a long answer about a short, <laughs> short question, but another great question. Thank you so much. Maybe we can go now and, and, and spend the last 10 minutes on a few of the questions. Did you have any slides on that or do you uh, want no, to I, these two questions? No, I'll just answer them very quickly. So the first question, is that okay? The yes. first question is, is there a way we can make these standards more accessible to teachers in the classroom? Typical teacher education does not put a lot of focus on this content. Should we have a standards related resource for teachers who are developing their own test? And I'm happy to say that the, the, the most recent NCME board has discussed this next iteration of the standards and things we would like to see. For example, um, we have now a free online um, version with um, some links to different chapters, but it would be great to have an online, a free online version of the next iteration that has links with cross references to make these things easier. Um, we talked about having many papers or web pages with highlights from each chapter that we could make available to teachers for free and point them to it as a teacher resource. Personally, I'd like to see more short videos that explain uh, concepts of testing to the public and not just the statistical parts, but also the non-statistical humanistic let's help your kid part. Like once you get this test result, what do you do with it? And, and so, yeah, I, I got some uh, other ideas, but um, those are the main ones. Yeah, another question was, are there new types of testing assessment used in education that are not present here in this chapter, but are becoming important? And what I'd say is I think most testing types are covered by this volume in some form or another but not all perspectives, right? And that's what I was talking about in my previous talk. I mean, we have to, it's not the type of test, it's how it's built, it's how it's administered, it's how we use those scores, it's all these other things that really need to expand. I don't care what test type you develop, like games or, or, or um, situational judgment tests. I mean, they all can fit into this framework. The whole framework needs to expand, though, to include uh, concepts of equity. And, and that's where I see the big push. Um, let's see what else. After all the situations that having during COVID-19 pandemic, love this question, are there gaps in the standards? And particularly in chapter 12, it became more evident because of the pandemic. And I'd say the first one has to do with um, accessibility and accommodations. And, and so the pandemic showed us that this section is really not sufficient. It seems to focus mostly on students with disabilities and um, English language learners multilingual students, but we saw all sorts of issues of access for people in poor districts, like in the middle of Detroit, or uh, people who lived in rural areas. We saw cultural issues with forcing students to test online who may be adverse to sitting in front of a camera because it just, it's against their culture to take a picture or whatever. And, and it feels like they're being um, possessed or something. Uh, something else that's not covered in this chapter that's becoming more apparent has to do with score reporting. The most important thing for a parent and for the teacher too 
is actionable information. And if the test results don't help educators decide what to do next, what good are they really? So they're only good for putting people in boxes, which is kind of silly. Um, oh shoot, now I got that uh, song in my head. Little boxes on the hillside, yeah. So anyway, but that's neither here nor there. The point is that we really have to think about why are we testing and how can we use this information? And the best way to find out, the best way to use the information is to ask the people that you're testing, what do you need? How can we help you? Let's build a test that does that for you. And they'll be like, thank you so much. And instead of going, I hate this test, they'll be like, this is great because this is how I find out how I can advance, what I need to do to make my um, life easier or better. Um, so why do these educational testing standards not include in-class testing? They do, but let me come back to that. And, and so how has the state of educational assessments changed over the past 10 years? And what critical changes do you foresee uh, for the next 10 years? And so if you ask me, I think the Biggest change has been the Every Student Succeeds Act, which was signed into law by President Obama in 2015. And the main purpose of ESSA is to make sure public schools provide a quality education for all kids. And ESSA gives states more of a say in how schools do this, how they account for student achievement. And this includes the achievement of disadvantaged students. And, and I might mention because of ESSA, Hawaii could do what Hawaii did. And, and so these uh, uh, students fall into four key categories. So you have students in poverty, um, uh, minorities, students who receive special ed, and those with limited English language skills. And you have to, ESSA says, you have to decide on education, and you can, as a state, decide on these plans for these students, but you have to do it so that every student learns. And, and it's within a framework provided by the federal government, so there's accountability, and the law also offers parents a chance to weigh in. And the most important part of this to me is the peer review process, which tends to be, for the most part, rigorous. And, and it keeps the states honest with respect to tests they're using to make sure that the tests meet the standards and to make sure that those kids are taken care of. And, and those peer reviewers, uh, lots of them are academics. They're parents, you know, they're, they're educators. They're not state administrators, right? So they, I think they're doing a great job of, of making sure that administrators don't cut corners. So where is the biggest gap between research and educational assessments and the challenge you meet in practice? Thank you so much for asking this. Um, what topics do you think students can work on that would bridge this gap in today's world? So see, here's the difference between academic research and testing practice. It's like the difference between those solved problems in the textbooks and those beast problems you get for homework. And academics often forget that theory is just that. It's a theory. And real life is under no obligation to cooperate. So it rarely does. And, and if we're being responsible in practice, we're going to improvise, we'll adapt, we'll overcome, and we'll continually check the assumptions and compare our results against past trends, against concurrent evidence to make sure everything is consistent. And if we're being irresponsible, we'll force our models onto the data without checking assumptions we we'll assume that things work out just like they do in our simulations and we'll be wrong and test takers will suffer because of it. So nothing works like it does in the book, folks. So, so you got to be extra diligent to make sure that things make sense in the end. You got to check, got to check everything. And uh, why is classroom assessment not part of this chapter? Do you agree with the claims mentioned at the beginning saying that testing in that context is somehow out of scope for the recommends? recommendations given by the standards. And I'll, I'll, I have to say that I did not see that. The chapter does not, ex here's what it says. The chapter does not explicitly address issues related to tests developed or selected exclusively to inform learning and instructive instruction at the classroom level. Those tests often have consequences for students, including influencing instructional actions, placing students in educational programs and affecting grades that may affect admission to colleges. The standards provide desirable criteria of quality that can be applied to such tests. However, as with past editions, practical considerations limit the standards applicability at the classroom level. Formal validation practices are often not feasible for classroom tests because schools and teachers don't have the resources to document the characteristics of their tests and are not publishing their tests for widespread use. Nevertheless, core expectations of validity, reliability, precision, and fairness should be considered 
in the development of such tests. All they're saying is that um, uh, you can't expect that fourth grade teacher in, in um, uh, math class to have reliability uh, estimates on, on that classroom test. I mean, it's just not feasible. Now, if you have a, a more standardized classroom assessment, yeah, those are going to have to meet those standards very closely. But your average, like, French quiz, nah, I mean, really? But they ought to be paying attention to the basic things, like, um, is the score on the test reflective of some level of knowledge in the classroom? Do these results um, give me some indication of where I need to go next in terms of what to teach and, and how to teach it? And, and to that extent, I think they're, like, they're still applicable, but we can't hold like your, your basic high school or middle school or grade school or kindergarten teacher to these standards. It's just, yeah, so we don't, but we, uh, they can use them. And I think that suggestion that we make this more available to pe people in the classroom in a simpler form is a great one to help them feel that they can benefit from these uh, without having to um, uh, live and die by them. You know, not, they're not going to be punished if they don't do it right. I think that was the last question. Did yes. I miss anything? Yes, yes, yes. You cover all the questions. All right. Uh, I mean, we are close to the time, but maybe we can leave a few minutes uh, just to have a last comments or follow-ups. Yeah, any other questions? If, if not, I have a quick exhortation. And that is... Um, don't give in. Like you're going to be pressured. Like if you go into anything related to testing, you're going to be pressured to conform to the way things have always been done. Don't do it. Like keep fighting. And, and you're up against it because anything, have you noticed how anything related to anything that revolves around individual differences or people thinking for themselves or, or actually improving the lives of every individual meets with all sorts of legislative um, furor, like, I'm not going to pick on, yes, I am, Florida, Virginia, you know, uh, why? I mean, why? What, what, what's it to you? Like, I just want to say, what's it to you? Is it changing your life at all if somebody uh, reads a book about gay people? Really? Do you have to rip out of your library? It, it, what is it to you, you know, if, if, um, if somebody mentions, uh, uh, like, social emotional learning? Look, basically what you're saying is, get that stuff out of my schools because I'm trying to, uh, you're trying to teach people to think for themselves, and that's a no-no. So don't give in. I mean, just keep fighting, even if it seems like um, it's an in, in insurmountable problem. Don't give up. I, I had this picture this morning of like a little bug, um, like treading water in a flushing toilet. You know, uh, this is how life feels sometimes. But you keep swimming to the very end. Never give up and um, don't be defeated. And, and, and that's the only way we're going to have a difference. Yeah. yeah. This was really, really, really good. Thank you very much, Dr. Walker. Um, I'm just a mic. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> uh, thank you very much uh, thank for, you. for all of this and for responding our questions, for your presentation. Um, and yeah, even for your um, encouragement also. Yeah, um, I think during the study group, um, the people that have been able to participate in more, in more, 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 more times, like during the, the study group. Um, yeah, I think that there has been some, some, the start of some early critique about the standards that I think is very aligned with, with, with the, the topic that you, you have mentioned. And I, I think we are still we are still unsure on how exactly it's going to to how exactly is that we we can have some influence in the next version of the standards and if the people that are going to write the new version of the standards are going to be open to hear all of this um i mean for i don't know for example in, in jennifer uh, in, in the session with, with professor Randall, there was a big discussion about how fairness and validity relates and why is that fairness is put in like third place and validity first when actually maybe in terms of priority the, those should be switched and that could be like a very big change in the new version of the standard but it still sounds so big that it, it, it kind of 
I, I, I can see how he can he create a little bit the feeling of um, of difficulty if you want, like how how likely it's going to be that you you can like push in certain direction here. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that uh, still we need to keep proposing, fighting, discussing, making the case for and advocating for these things. Yeah. And regardless, because the standard, the new standards are going to disappoint me. I know that already. Because there's no way that you can really encapsulate all the things that I feel into a book, right? But um, no matter what the standards say, you know, you can live your life the way you want to. You can uh, interact with your students the way you want to. You can push for test development in your organization the way you want to. And, and that's what's important. Do what's right, and you'll be fine. All righty. Thank you very much. And thank nice you. To see you all. Thank you all for your attention and for this opportunity. Uh, I, I love sharing my ideas and I'm looking forward to the great things for your group too. Great. All righty.